Good morning everyone who have joined us today on Facebook and on YouTube. Welcome to Ministries of Hope Christian Church Sunday morning service. I am Reverend Haverly Hutchings. Let us lift up God and ask his blessings on this sermon today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord God for today. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Dear Lord, I give you honor and glory. Decrease me, Lord God, and let your word flow through me by your Holy Spirit. Bless the hearts and minds of your people so that they will receive your word and adhere to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Again, this is Ministries of Hope Christian Church, located at 385 Garrisonville Road, Suite 99 in Stafford, Virginia. Please come on down and worship with us. Join us, just have fun worshiping in the Holy Spirit with us when this corona pandemic is over. We are under the pastoral leadership of Reverend Senior Pastor um, Flory Williams. Her dedication, her love for the Word of God has truly inspired us to search this Word and grow with a stronger, deeper relationship for God, and I thank her for that. Uh, giving honor to the ministers of this house, my family, my husband, just thanking them for their support and the strength that they have given me when I need it most. And certainly, last but not least, to you who is watching faithfully on Facebook and YouTube, welcome. And may God bless your life and change your heart in a mighty way. Our sermon today comes to us from the second book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, first and second Samuel, I believe, um, is believed to have been compiled by three prophets, Samuel, Nathan, and Gad. Today we're going to look at one of the stories that they captured in 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is of King David. King David is said to be the greatest king that ever lived, a man after God's own heart. Well, we're going to see here that even a man such as this was not perfect. God, he made mistakes after mistakes, but when he acknowledged his wrongdoing and when he recognized his unrighteousness, he repented from his wicked ways and worshipped God, and then his grace and his protection and his prosperity was once more um, given back to him. David started in humble beginning. He was a shepherd boy who up until this point um, had unprecedented blessings and protection from the Lord. The Lord directed Samuel to anoint him as king when he was yet but a boy and you know David was has known for his victory over Goliath God gave him that victory I know you hear the story of David and Goliath the, the boy who killed the giant that was God's protection over David he also protected him against King Saul because he was anointed to be king before while Saul was still king so Saul jealous and rage allowed Saul to go after him to kill him but the Lord protected David against um, Saul he also gave him victories over cities allow him to conquer cities David defeated even the Jebusites and took the city of Jerusalem and made it his capital. He defeated the Philistines and returned the Ark of the Covenant to the capital, which is Jerusalem. So David was successful not only in, in life, but in battles that God gave him the victory over. Now, when he became king, when, when Saul died, and when Saul died, he became king. And, and three of his sons, he became th king over Judah. And then when the, the death of um, Saul's other son, um, uh, Ishbotheth, um, David became king over the entire Israel. So now David is the king over Israel, and he is prospering. So Israel is now prospering as well. 
Now, even after all this prosperity, David has been and, and David has been blessed. He knew that God was in his life. But in 2 Samuel um, chapter 11, you will see it shows that all of us, even this man who is after God's own heart, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even though you've sinned and come short of the glory of God, is what you do after you sin that 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 God is looking at because you got to to turn around recognize recognize your unrighteousness and do something about it so let us go to second Samuel's um, chapter 11 follow me in in the Bible and I'm going to tell you the story in in my own word I'm, I'm going to tailor make it to my understanding so um, you follow in the Bible and um, we're going to start at verse 1. Verse 1 says, um, chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1 says, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him, and all, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ahmed. Now, the, when I... When I, I I studied it says during the 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 and it came to pass during this um, the year was expired it explained to me that this was during springtime springtime is when most of the men can leave their their fields and go to war because um, now they have already plowed the field and now things are growing so it's it's time for the woman can handle you know um, reaping the crops so the men can get gather and go off to defend their country and this is what King David did he told Job um, Joab which is his nephew to and the captain of his guard to take the army out and go to battle so Joab obeyed David and he went out to battle and he wiped out all the Ammonites and had the city of Rahab surrounded by his soldiers and his forces so the the, the Bible says that and beseech um, Reba, um and the word beseech there means that they have this the city surrounded ready to capture it but at the end of that verse it said but david tarried until at uh still at jerusalem that means david didn't go into battle kings normally go off with their army going into battle but this time david stayed back home and um don't know why David stayed back home at this time, but when you are not doing the things that you normally do, for example, going to work on a daily basis, now you have extra time at home that you never had before. You have to replace those idle time that you never had before with something constructive. If you do not replace those idle times with something constructive, then it gives room to Satan to operate. It gives the opportunity to him to operate and to attack you when your guard is down. So you have to do something that will bring you closer to God, that will occupy that time so that Satan don't have the opportunity to get in and wreak havoc. It says in, in, in verse 2, and it came to pass in the eventide that David rose up from his bed. Now, that is telling me that he was resting. He was taking a rest. He's not out there in the battlefield. Now, he is taking a rest, and he walked out on, on the roof of his palace, but then when he looked down, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. Now, in those days, the roof of the houses were flat, and, and when it gets hot, they normally go outside, and lay out on the roof to, to get cooler and even sometimes they lay out there and sleep um, on top of the roof in the night so this is something that they normally do you know so um 
when David, and think about it, David is the king, and this is his palace, so I'm, I'm supposing that it is it towering high above all the other houses that you can, he can stay on his balcony on the top of his roof and look down over his people that he's king of. So when he looked down, of course he's going to see um, whatever they're doing. So this woman, this beautiful woman, was taking a bath. And he saw, he noticed it. Now, of course... The devil is going to play tricks, is going to, to seize the opportunity to, to go in and, and find work for idle thoughts. So David um, sent out his, his men. He wanted to know more who this is. He's a king and he's never seen this beautiful woman before. So now he sent out his men to go find out who this woman is. When the men returned, they told David who this woman is. His, her, they said his, her name was Beersheba, and that she was the daughter of Elm, and that she was Uriah's wife. I'm sure David know exactly who Uriah was, because Uriah was one of his general out there in the front of his fighting, fighting for him, but David don't, don't really matter about that. He's not here. He's not at home. You know, so I, if David, in, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind that he said, he's thinking that, hey, if I take her now, then Uriah would never know, right? And that way he has, he got what he wanted and go on about life like nothing ever happened. Remember, this is a man after God's own heart. That is wrong in so many different ways. So, but David, being a man of flesh, being a man, is not thinking with the heart of God at this time. He is thinking with his flesh. And we do that a lot um, uh, when we don't confer the, the word of God. We think with our flesh. David sent some messengers to be a Shiva and says, bring Uriah's, ask, I'm asking them to bring Uriah's wife to him. Of course, as a young lady, if, the, if my king call me and tell me to come on to him, I am going to go. And I'm not even going to lie. I'm going to hope that it, I'm, I'm probably going to stand into the presence and blush and, you know, Yes, I have a husband, but come on, this is the king. I might just really want him to like me, you know, or something, because then I probably can benefit from this. And this is just my thinking, you know. So when when he sent for, for Beersheba, there's nothing in the word that said that she refused her king. No, he says David slept with, with him. He went to David and slept with him. And Beersheba returned home. Now, after she returned home, I'm thinking that is, this is like a few weeks later on because it takes about six weeks for a woman to, to find out that she's pregnant. So later, um, she sent word to the king and says that she is pregnant. Now, Uriah is still out there on the battlefield. Now, David's little act, he has gotten caught up in his little act of sin because now... The, he might can hide the act, but the fact that the act produced a baby, that means that he cannot hide the act anymore. He can hide that he, he, he went to bed with her from man. But because he cannot hide nothing from God, then God, there was a seed that was planted inside this, 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 this sinful cycle that is going to bring forth the action to light. So now David, know, knowing this, has to try to cover up his action. So the king had Joab, which is his nephew, captain of the guard, send for Uriah the Hittite and bring him to him. So he, he, now he, when Uriah arrived, the king started making small talk because this is one of his general, right? 
So he's like, how is the war going on? And, you know, you're doing a good job. And, and this is putting it all into my word. You're doing a good job. You can go on home and take a rest and then go on back out there since you're doing such a good job. But Uriah left his soldiers out there knowing that he is a soldier himself. I, who have um, been in the United States Army and have been to battle with my soldiers as a leader, I could not feel good within myself to leave my soldiers in the battlefield and come home to take a rest and sleep in a comfortable bed, um, drink wine in the cool when my soldiers are out there on the hard ground um, in the dew of the night just waiting to pounce. No, I, me as a general, me as a captain, me as a soldier could not feel right to leave my troops on the battlefield. So therefore, Uriah had the same kind of feelings of turmoil within himself. He would feel too guilty to be enjoying the spoils of life when his soldiers are out there trying to defend his the, the honor of this of the country. So he left he's he's not going to, to disobey his king or um, say anything back, talk back to the king, but he left his prison and he did not go home. Instead, he slept out at the palace entrance. No, David plan is spoiled because his intention was to have him go home, sleep with his wife so that it can cover up David's sin. So when David found out that he didn't go home, he was shocked. He called him. He says, uh, why didn't you go home? I sent you home. Why didn't you go home? Uriah, as a dedicated soldier, said to him, as long as Judah, Israel, the ark are still out there in tents, in, in, in other words, are still out there on the battlefield, I can't go home and eat and drink and leave and, and lay, sleep with my wife. No, that is just unethical. You know, I can't, I can't do that. I couldn't have the heart to do that. So now David do not know what to do. He got to come up with another plan of how to cover his sin. You see, when you are hiding your sin, when you are lying about your, your sinful ways, then it takes another lie, another sin to cover that first sin in the first place. Then... David think about it and now he can't keep Uriah longer than is necessary so he got to send him back out there on the battlefield but David thought of another way he wrote a letter to his captain which is Joab and gave it to Uriah which is his general and said give this to Joab so um Uriah took the letter that from his from his king and took it out there to his captain. And when his captain read it, David told Joab to put Uriah in the front at the fiercest part of the fight and then pull away from him, draw back away, leave him in the front so that he can get killed. So Joab obeyed his king, put Uriah in the front of the battle, pulled back from him, and Uriah died in battle. Then then Joab sent David the, the message telling him that Uriah is dead. Now this makes David, um, it's, it's like, oh, yes, okay, all right, this plan work. So now David can take Beersheba as wife and cover up the wrong that he did in the first place. When Beersheba, the right wife of Uriah, learned that her husband was dead, she mourned. Of course she's going to mourn, because even though she's cheating on him, she don't wish him dead. So, she mourned. And after she mourned, when the mourning period was over, David thought that he had his cake and eaten it at the same time. He sent for um, Beersheba and took her, marry her, and they had their son together. But what David don't realize even now, that what he did, what he has done, displeased God. 
You see, you can hide from man, but you cannot hide from God. And you see the cycle of sin. What that, that right there, the cycle of sin where David um was enticed on the rooftop, act in on his enticement, and then completed that act of sin when he sent for her and slept with her. Then to add to all of that, he adds deceitful murder of Uriah and then continues about his life like nothing took place. But you see, when God is not pleased with your action, he will send his word to you. He, he has a way of chastening those who he loves according to Hebrews 1 and 6. He will make sure that you know that you have done wrong in his sight. Remember, the greatest battles don't usually come when you are working hard. They come when you are you are at leisure, when you think it not, when your hands are down, when you are bored, then Satan find um and entice you and find work for idle hands. We got to realize that no one is immune from the temptation of sin. Not even a king, not me, not our pastor, not the president, and certainly not you. The temptation becomes a problem when we know that we have sinned, but then we create excuses to justify why we are still in that sinful cycle. Excuses that allow us to go about life as if the voice of God doesn't matter. You see, God watched over David and David knew this. And he took it for granted that he can do whatever he want to do. Just like God watches over us today. And the, he, he, we are not to take it for granted that we can do whatever we want to do. It is not so. This is not a one-way street. We cannot just take, take, take from God and do nothing. And believe that because we are not committing those obvious sins, like um, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10 says, that we are safe. No, not so. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 and 9 tells us, and reading from the NIV version, that for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that any man should boast. See, you, there are two different types of sin that we as human beings can commit. Sin of commission and sin of omission. The children of, as children of God, we need to be on high alert for the sins in our lives, for it can hinder our prayer life, it can lead to chastisement and even lead to death and misery. Sin of commission are sins that we committed by doing something we know we shouldn't do. It's the type of sin in which we are we are so familiar with that type of sin. For example, when, when George Floyd um, got killed, we knew that that was brutal. We were disgusted because we knew upfront that that is blatant murder. That is a sin of commission. Then when a man cheats on his wife, we immediately know that he committed adultery. Those are sins that you can recognize. Those are sin of commission. It is something someone did that they shouldn't have done. Sins of omission are sins we committed by not doing the things that we should do. This kind of sin is he easy to hide from others. It is difficult to commit a sin of commission and get away with it because then you can get um, sentenced, you can get fined. It is quite easy to commit a sin of omission without nobody knowing. Therefore, I think the, the sin of omission is perhaps the most dangerous for those of us who are trying to walk this Christian walk.
In James chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, to a man that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. De um, David in this chapter committed both the sin of commission and the sin of omission. The sin of commission was um, he, he had adultery, deceit. And when he led a man to be killed, that's murder. The sin of omission that he committed, that David committed, was lust, refusing to repent from um, of his sins. There are things that we do on a daily basis that we don't see as unrighteousness, that may be categorized as sin of omission. No, I'm going to count them, some of, just a few of them down. One, Failing to pray on a regular basis or failing to pray for others in your life. Consider what the prophet Samuel says in 1 Samuel um, chapter 12 and verse 23. Who, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Two, tithing. Failing to tithe, you must always be good steward and do not fail. You have to be faithful stewards in your finances. As uh, Malachi 3 and verse 8 says, Will a man rob from God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have I robbed thee? In tithe and offering. When you fail to help others, when we both know we, we have the capacity to do so and we feel the nudging of the Holy Spirit that we should help them but we refuse to. Remember, James 4 and 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. When you fail to provide for your family, your whole household, especially those Men who get um, these young ladies pregnant and have no intention of supporting her or even raising their own child. First Timothy 5 and verse 8 tell us that but if any provide not for his own and especially for those in his own house, he has denied the faith and worse he and is worse than an infidel. If you fail to worship, if you forsake the assembly, Hebrews 10 and verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembly of others to, of, of uh, ourselves together as the manner of some it, some is, but exalting one another. So much more is ye seeing the day approaches. Last but not least, six. I bring to your attention failing to read and study the word of God regularly because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For it, if you don't read and study the word regularly, your faith will be weak because you are preventing yourself from hearing from God through his word. I come across a quote from D.L. Moody that says, Either this book, which is the Bible, will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. I say to you, what will it be? Can you recognize yourself in this David story? Perhaps there is something in your presence or in your past that is tearing you apart and making you wonder if you can even do the right thing again. But when we go further in our next studies in 2 Samuel 2 and chapter 12, we will see where Dave, we will see David's repentance. We will see the consequences that he had to pay. And we will see God's mercies again at work in David's life. The good news I bring you today is that when you recognize your unrighteousness and repent, then God will show mercy. Just like he, that's why he sent Jesus Christ to hang on the cross, not because of his sin, but rather because of the sins of David, the, my sins, your sins, and the sins of all those who reject him. 
The cross does not erase the seriousness of the evil we commit, nor does it mean that there is no consequences to what we do. Rather, the cross just crosses them out and make it possible for life to continue and for God to do great things in your life. We have come to call this amazing grace. Yes. As we ask him, saying, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. You've heard the word of God, and I want He wants you to come to Him. He wants you to pray a prayer of repentance. He says that in Romans 10 and verse 9, he says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Pray with me right now this prayer of repentance. Close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of salvation. I believe that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again from the dead and that whosoever believed in him will not perish but receive eternal life. Come into my heart, Lord, and change my life. I receive you, Lord, as Savior, and will follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing my prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer for um, just now, you are saved. Welcome into the kingdom of, of God. If you don't have a church home, call us, inbox us on Facebook or on YouTube and become a part of this body, Ministries of Hope Christian Church. We welcome you. It doesn't matter how far you are because we can reach you no matter where you are. We can build you and we can give you the foundation of the true and living word of God. Amen. I will be on this line for the next 15 minutes. Um, so you can call me and I will pray with you and, and do your confirmation over the phone. The number to call is 605-313-5388. Access code 379-088 pound. And it's for the next 15 minutes. Bible st uh, we have um, Bible studies on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Facebook and YouTube. We have um, prayer, um, pray with us on Tuesdays from 7.30 to 8 at 605-313-5388, access code 319-088-POUND. Sunday School, which is a continuation of Bible studies from Wednesday, is broadcast on Ministries of Hope Christian Church Facebook on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Sunday sermons are here at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. So join us on Facebook and YouTube. Donation to this ministry can be made at ministriesofhopechristianchurch.com using the Square or PayPal. Thank you so much for joining us, and God bless you and change something in your life in a mighty way. Amen. <laughs>